And before we begin, let's just bow our heads and pray that the Lord will be with us as we continue to worship him in honour and in truth. Dear Lord, we're about to tackle a new sermon today and to, to tackle some new things. We always like to learn new things with you. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us and make sure that we have the correct understanding of the things that are being taught and that they will be with us as we live for you from day to day. Help us to take on board what is being said and that it will help us to better follow you. Not only that, but to also share with others, both within and outside our church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The... Um, I've put a different title on the slide as to what I put on my um, on my sermon notes and my sermon notes actually says uh, from whence comes authority but I'm just as happy with the other one what's in a name and so what I want to do is I want to address something that we have found in the Bible or that I have found in the Bible but is not actually spelt out and is there a precedent for dealing with things that we find principles in the Bible for and the Bible doesn't expressly state them. Well, we do. For example, there's no mention of tobacco in the Bible and yet Adventists in good standing ban tobacco from their lives under the premise that it destroys their body. And this stance is justified on a principle that is clearly found in the following verses in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy which temple ye are okay so that's a principle that we use to justify our stance on many things, in, especially in the health message that we hold to in the Adventist Church today. Now, in the last few years, I came across a new principle which I'd never seen, but it very slowly came to my attention. <coughs> First of all, I will spell out the principle and then I'm going to go into detail justifying why this principle should apply both in our daily lives and also in the Bible. And here it is. The name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. You will not find this principle expressly written in the Bible but is, is there nonetheless. What this sermon aims to do is to show that this principle can be found in the Bible, that it is clearly there and that it has implications that will be extremely unpopular with God-haters, that is, the world, but will also be uncomfortable to many who ostensibly follow Christ. I firstly became dimly aware of this principle over 20 years ago when the company I was working for at the time in Brisbane decided it was time to move house. They moved into a brand new building and took up the whole top floor of this particular building that had two levels. The landlord, in, appreci in appreciation of the fact that we were his first tenant and that we took up the whole floor of the building, gave the company the naming rights to that particular building. So a sign went up and was very proudly displayed on the front of the building. And even I, as a mayor worker for the company, took a certain pride in seeing that sign there. So the question came to my mind later. Naming rights? 
who can give naming rights away? Well, in this case, it was the owner of the building. The owner of the building had authority over all aspects of the building, including what the building would be called. And I've shown a picture here uh, of a building that has the name on it, Trump Tower. So presumably the owner of the building decided that that would be a good name to give it, and he had the right to do it. So the owner of the building had authority over all aspects of the building, including what the building would be called, but he could delegate naming authority to whomever he pleased. In our case, it was our company as first tenant of that building. Now, the interesting thing is he could also take that right back because, after all, it was his building. Now, where else do we see naming rights associated with authority. Consider a husband and wife decide they want a family. They immediately get to work and eventually a child is born. Who does this child belong to? Well, the parents. And who has the right to name that child? Once again, the parents. And finally, who has authority over that child? And once again, it is the parents. Children recognise the authority of their parents. And here, the principle holds. The name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. When children go to school, the parents delegate their authority to the teacher of the classroom. My wife Mary was assisting the teachers at a sporting function for the school she worked at. One of the teachers had her briefly supervise her class of children while she had to run off and do something. After a couple of minutes, the children challenged her authority. You're not our teacher. You're not our parents. You can't tell us what to do. The children recognised the order of authority. In fact, even when a family breaks apart through death or divorce, the children will still regard the biological parent as having the greater authority. God recognises this order of authority. He recognises it so much that he put it into the Ten Commandments, giving us the following admonition. In Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So, we've established the naming principle exists for parents in real life. But what is the principle of name giving that we find in the law of man? Well, let us consider something as mundane as Australia. If you take a look at this map, this map was originally drawn by Matthew Flinders. And if you take a look at the coast of Papua New Guinea, you'll notice that there are bits of it missing. This is because one of the questions that Matthew Flinder had, actually, I won't say anything at the moment. I'll just read this quote that I've got here, and then I'll make commentary. Matthew Flinders was the first to circumnavigate the continent and chart the unknown coast. By 1803, the complete outline of the great southern land was mapped, but Flinders' detention at Mauritius delayed the publication of his journal and atlas until their eventual appearance in 1814. Flinders used Terra Australis. On his charts, he recognised that now that he had determined that New South Wales and New Holland were one land, that there should be a general name for the whole continent. In the introduction to A Voyage to Terra Australis, Flinders wrote, Had I permitted myself any invitation upon the original term, it would have been to convert it to Australia, as being more agreeable to the ear and as an assimilation to the names of the other great portions of the earth. Flinders' chart accompanying the book was entitled 
general chart of Terra Australis or Australia. However, Flinders' patron, Sir Joseph Banks, preferred Terra Australis. In 1817, Governor Macquarie of New South Wales received a copy of Flinders' book and immediately started to use Australia in his official correspondence. Later, explorer Philip Parker King also used Australia on his maps on the northern, oh, sorry, of the northern and western coasts, and by the end of the 1820s, Australia was commonly used as the continent's name. <coughs> now, so there we go. It took the people with authority to decide that it was going to be called Australia and not something else, which it could well have been. Now let's consider also the name of a very famous landmark in the middle of Australia, a great big red rock that every red-blooded Australian has heard about. Australia's most famous natural landmark has two names, Uluru and Ayers Rock. So which one is correct? Well, it turns out the rock was called Uluru long before Europeans arrived in Australia. The word is a proper noun from the Pityanjatjarat language, and I'm sorry for mangling that pronunciation. And it doesn't have an English translation. In 1873, the explorer William Goss became the first non-Aboriginal person to see Uluru. He named it Ayers Rock after Sir Henry Ayres, the Chief Secretary of South Australia at the time. And that would mean, uh, just going away from that particular quote, that it was known as Ayres Rock for around about a hundred years or so. Ayers Rock was the most widely used name until 1993 when the rock was officially renamed Ayers Rock slash Uluru. The first feature in the Northern Territory to be given dual names. In 2002, and though these names were reversed at the request of the Regional Tourism Association in Alice Springs, and the rock took on the official name of Uluru slash Ayers Rock, which it still has today. That means you can use either Uluru or Ayers Rock to refer to the rock. However, in the National Park, we always use the original name Uluru. So let's consider what has happened as far as the name of this rock is concerned. In the days before the settlers, the indigenous people had a name for the rock. When the settlers came, they asserted authority over this rock and named it accordingly. Later on, they decided that the original holders of the land had true authority over that rock and their name for it was reinstated. So as you can see, in the secular world, those who hold authority over an entity also possess naming rights over that entity. You will find thousands of examples of this in action. When new residential estates are being built with streets and all associated amenities, the first thing you will often see are street names being posted. Now that means someone will have named those streets. So we're in a situation where the Name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. This principle holds true in the secular world. So now the question arises, does this principle hold true in the Bible? The short answer is yes, it does. Now I'm going to provide you with a number of examples which will prove this to be so. Let's consider the following story in Genesis. Genesis 35, 16-18 And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labour. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labour, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. Let's consider what happened here. 
the mother gave a name and yet the father overrode that with his own name you will never see Benoni uh, ever appear in the Bible again the father used his authority to determine what the name of the child will be so once again we see this principle that the name giver asserts authority over the name receiver now I'm just going to break out of the um, slide for a moment because I want us to go and have a quick look at a web page ah. okay let's hit the escape that's better now I have here my favorite Bible software as far as uh, web based software is concerned and I've used this quite often and one of the things we can do is we can type in here called his name and then we'll see what kind of results pop up and if you take a look it will say occurs 217 times in 61 verses including 32 exact phrases shown first so if you have a quick look down here you'll see the in in the highlight in red called his name and if you want to do it yourself sometime you can take a look but and most of the time it is parents giving a name to their children so it's a very common practice in their children of course you've got Adam who called his wife's name Eve we've got uh, Cain and they have a son that they give a name and yeah so you could keep going down there for quite a bit and now I'm not going to uh, focus too much on that today because I'm more interested in other matters now I've got to find my here we are okay so let's go back to where I had got to um, ah yes right let's go back into this But what about those who came under the authority of different people? Let's consider the story of Joseph, who had his brothers throw him on to the Ishmaelites, who interestingly enough were relatives of, of um, Jacob, who took him off to Egypt and had him sold off as a slave. Well, one thing led to another, and eventually he became second in charge in Egypt. And that means that only Pharaoh had authority over Joseph. And how did he recognize this authority or assert this authority? Let's read Genesis 41, verse 45. And Joseph called Joseph's name zaphnath Pania, and he gave to him wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now, here's an interesting little bit, tidbit of information. I only came across this as I was looking the, all of this up during the week. The name Zaphnathpaneer is to means treasury of the glorious rest. And when I look at this, I think that I see two things here. Number one, Pharaoh is asserting authority over Joseph, and that's fair enough, he has that right. But number two, in the name that Pharaoh gave Joseph, he is acknowledging that Joseph was effectively the man who saves Egypt. So once again, what we see here is that the Pharaoh of Egypt assert authority over Joseph by giving him a new name. So once again, the principle is hold that the name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. What about when the Jewish people came under the authority of Babylon. Let's take a look at Daniel 1, starting at verse 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, 
Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, under whom the prince of the eunuchs, eunuchs gave the names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now these four worthies got names the Babylonians deemed appropriate, but once again we see that it is after these gentlemen came under their authority. The Babylons, Babylonians now assert their authority over them. And once again the principle holds that the name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. What about the time when we ourselves get to heaven? Do we keep our old names? Let's take a look. Revelation 3.12 To him that overcometh I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem which cometh out of heaven from my God and I'll write upon him my new name. Let's take a look at Isaiah. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Then we go to Revelation 2. 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Clearly we receive a new name from the Lord, and once again, the principle holds, the name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. And this can only mean that we all come under the authority of God in the new earth. Okay, so here's a question. And we're going to divide, divert briefly. Because we've been talking about the assertion of authority. So let's divert briefly and consider what does it mean to have authority well, when the centurion met Jesus in the way, he quite clearly defined what authority meant. So let's take a look. In Matthew 8, 8 and 8, 9, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servants shall be healed. Well, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. The centurion here defines authority as possessing the power to command those under his authority. Furthermore, he has the right to ex expect obedience. Did Jesus recognize this as being a correct definition of authority? Well, let's take a look. When we look at uh, Matthew 8 verses 10 through to 13, we find the following. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and the Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. There is not a hint of contradiction to the centurion's definition of authority. In fact, it would appear that Jesus is in 
full agreement with the centurion's definition by virtue of the fact that Jesus honoured his request at the inn. Now, I'm going to say this regarding authority. Authority and responsibility go together. The higher the level of authority, the higher the degree of responsibility. For this reason, God who has all the authority also has all the responsibility. The Bible supports this concept. Consider how God responded to the devil after he had permitted him to destroy everything that Job had. So we're going to go to Job 2, verse 3. Because I like you guys to see what we're doing. Yeah, that's good. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, even though thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. Who is taking responsibility in this verse? Well, clearly God took responsibility for what happened to Job. Now how could this be? And after many years of thinking and considering, I finally arrived at the following concept. Responsibility without authority is slavery. Authority without responsibility is tyranny. God is not a slave that he should bend to our will. Neither is he a capricious tyrant lashing out at those who do not obey. Instead, he has ultimate authority that goes along with ultimate responsibility. There is an attempt by many today to give the devil all the responsibility for all the bad things that happen to us without realising that by doing so they're giving the devil authority for some of the things that happen in this world. Now, is the question of the authority limited to people and animals? According to the scriptures, God has authority over the material world. Let's take a look at some of the questions that God asked Job. So we're going to jump into Job 38. And we're going to run up to verse 8. And we'll take a look at these three verses, oh, four verses actually. So it says here, Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I came, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and a thick darkness, a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Now, I'm just going to go off on a small ramble here. There is a fear by many people in the world today that the sea level is going to rise. And I am going to say that this verse here, verse 11, is proof that the sea level will not rise because it is God who is in authority of the sea. So this implies that God has authority over the elements such as the sea. What about uh, verse 12? Has thou commanded the morning since the days and caused the day spring to know his place? So he obviously has authority over day and night. And what about verse 32? Let's take a quick look at that. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Here he is referring to heavenly bodies. He has authority over the heavenly bodies. All right. What about uh, verse 34? Canst thou lift thy voice up to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? In other words, can you command the rain? Canst thou send, in the very next verse, canst thou send lightnings, that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are. There it is. 
can you do that? So he has authority over the lightning. What about, uh, let's go to the next chapter. And we're going to take a quick look at verse 27. Does the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? Well, did God uh, command the anima animals to be um, to do things like this? Well, I think we can because one of God's original commands to the animals was to be fruitful and multiply. Now, here is another verse, Isaiah 5. And we're going to take a look at verse 6. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Where do we find this kind of thing happening? Well, the story of Elijah gives you a fairly clear circumstance where there was no rain or dew in Israel for about two or three years. Now, here is one of the most interesting ones. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4. We'll take a quick look and see what happens here. We're going to go to verse 39. And we'll take a look and see what it has to say. 39. Okay, well let's read up a little bit. We'll go back to 37. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest not thou not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? What are we seeing here? We're seeing that Christ has authority to command the elements. What else does Christ have authority over? Well, let's go and have a look at Mark 1 and verse 27. And we see God, or Christ, giving a command. Let's go back a little bit. And there was, back to verse 23, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. So what has Jesus just done here? He has made a command. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region around Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. And anon they tell him... Oh, hang on, what have I done there? I think I've just gone too far. Yes, okay, so I was supposed to stop at verse 27. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, so in other words, he commands the spirits and they obey him. All right, who else does he command? Let's go to John 11 
verse 43. And we have a situation here where Lazarus has died. And the first thing that Christ does is prayed to his father. So we start at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because the people which stand by I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. This was not a request. It was a command. And did it happen? Well, yes. The next very next verse says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. So what all these verses very strongly imply is that God can command the elements of nature and that they will obey Christ's dominion obviously extends to the devils and even the dead. So let's take a look at when Christ's authority over the elements was made manifest. In other words, let's consider the question. Did God name all these entities? Let's go and take a look at Genesis 1. Genesis 1 verse 5 and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So remember back in Job he said he had authority over those things. What about Genesis 1 8 and God called the firmament heaven and the evening and morning were the second day and Genesis 1 10 once again, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of waters called he seas and God saw that it was good. So God, by naming these entities, asserted authority over them, the authority to command those entities and to bring about their obedience. And as we have just seen, we have proven that he is and has given command to these entities and they have obeyed. Well, did God delegate any of his authority? Well, yes, he did. Let's go and take a look at Genesis 1, 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, and we'll continue to 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. Question here. Who gave God man his name? Well, obviously, it was God. So by the principles we're outlining so far, it's clear that man comes under God's authority for two reasons. One, God created man. Number two, God named man. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So he has been given dominion over the fish, the birds, and the animals on the earth, presumably insects as well. Okay. So he has clearly delegated authority over these beings to man. So what did God do? get man to do that would demonstrate his authority over the animal kingdom. Well, the 
first thing Adam was to do, his first job was to name all the animals, and once again the principle holds. The name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. And to check that out, we'll go into Genesis 2. And we'll take a quick look around about, here we go. Eighteen. Okay, Genesis two verse nineteen. Let's take a. Sorry, we'll start at eighteen. And the Lord God said, "It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him." But before that happens, he does the thing that I mentioned before. Genesis two verse nineteen. And out of the ground, the Lord formed. God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So here Adam is giving the names to the animals. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. I just got to make sure. So, Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, and every beast of the field, but for Adam... Okay, sorry, I just read that. So, part of the dominion that God extended to man was naming rights. The authority to name by Bible precedent also means the authority to command and require obedience. So once again the principle holds that the name giver asserts authority over the name receiver. So God's steps here are as follows. Number one, God creates the living creature. Number two, God brings the living creature before Adam. And number three, Adam gives the living creature a name. Now in today's world, we are coming to the most difficult part for those who would be politically correct. And let's keep reading. Verses 21 through to 24. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto him. Now, I don't know, I think some people get the impression that Adam remained asleep throughout this whole time. But some, some things I've read have indicated that he came back to consciousness as soon as God had taken the rib out. And this is how Adam was able to know that this rib which had been taken out of him was now part of Eve. And so he actually watched God make Eve. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So what happens here? Well, in it's the same pattern as occurred before. Number one, God creates a woman. Number two, God brings a woman before Adam. Number three, Adam gives this creature the name woman. Not only does he give her the name, but also outlines his reason for this name, something that is exclusive to the woman in the record. So as you can see, the pattern is established. God gave dominion to the, of the animals to Adam. Adam gives names to the animals as part of his dominionship. Adam gives the woman her name, therefore she comes under his dominion. What this means is that the woman was under the authority of the man right from the very beginning of her existence. Now this is answered a challenge that has bothered me for many years that has been put forward by those who claimed that man's authority over the woman came about only because of the curse of sin. The claim was that 
before sin, there was true equality in a manner as defined by feminists. This particular line of thinking has especially come from the camp of those pushing women's ordination. So if it wasn't the authority of a man over woman that sin brought into the world, then just exactly what came into the world? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to Genesis 3.14. I'll just click next. That's quicker. So Genesis 3 verse 14. And we see the... This is what I consider the part I hate the most about the whole Bible. The onset of sin in the world. And I guess a lot of people probably may feel the same way. But it's there nonetheless and we have to deal with it. The first thing uh, happens in, in these verses is that Lord um, brings down curses... And there are a series of curses here. So let's take a look and see what they are. And the Lord, Genesis 3 verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And then we shall go to the woman. Verse 16, unto the woman. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And right in here we find two concepts, and we'll come to those in a moment. Genesis 3 verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou hast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Pretty uncomfortable passage, eh? But let's take a look at the common ele element in all of these curses. The first one. The first one being back in verse 15. It said, You shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What has to happen that bruises shall manifest themselves. Well, there has to be an injury, and it is an injury that involves pain. What about the giving sorrow? Uh, what about sorrow in the birth of children? One of the things that pretty much any woman will tell you is that birth is a painful experience. So we've got pain there. What about this second bit here? And it says, I desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. What we see here is a change in the nature of relationships. We will see now that there is pain in the relationship. And so Adam and Eve go out, well, Adam especially, goes out to work the fields, and he's got thorns and thistles. And that's just reminded me. I'm going to bring up a picture. I had one. Here we are. When I was a young fella, I had to work in... Okay, I'll bring that over here first. I had to work in this field, or a field like this. And what do you see it full of? It's absolutely full of thistles. And I thought to myself at the time, yeah, I'll walk through the field and I'll do whatever I had to do. It was We were actually destroying weeds. There was a specific type of weed we were destroying. It was not thistles, unfortunately. Uh, it was known as the rosehip uh, weed and it causes a lot of problem up in the Snowy Mountain area and also up around the uh, table, northern tablelands of New South Wales. So anyway... I am fairly well dressed up for walking through this. I had long sleeve shirt 
and of course jeans and I walked through this field and I got home at the end of the day and my legs when I took those jeans off my legs were covered in blood spots the thistles had come through and they had caused um, what do you call it they had caused blood to give problems all over the place now um, the cowboys See if we can, oh yeah, the cowboys have um, a solution for that. They have something like this. I'll bring it, take a look at it. You'll see them wearing these things. They're made of leather. And they're to stop thorns and all sorts of other nasties from punching through their jeans and causing their legs to bleed. So pain is, even today, a very common part of working out in the field. Even if you work, men who work in construction, um, they experience pain. Did you know that 90% of workplace deaths are male? They experience workplaces, um, work, uh, pain in the workplace to the point of death. So let's take a look at these curses we've got and just see what it means. Well, what it means is that the pain is in all aspects of life while sin has dominion over this world. We have pain between man and animal. We have pain in bringing forth children. We have pain in relationships between husband and wife and we have pain in the labour of men. So what we can expect is that when sin is removed from this world, the pain will go with it. But as the order of authority between man and woman was part of the creation week, it means that women will continue to remain under the authority of man in heaven. Now, if you take a look at the way that the Bible regards women, it is clear it holds those who choose to be wives and mothers in high esteem. The world looks down on women who choose to go that path, referring to them by such delightful terms, and I'm saying that ironically, as breeders and baby factories. Now this should not be too much of a surprise given that evolutionists have downgraded man in general to being nothing more than a mere animal. And yet from a Christian perspective, one can see the value in following God's command to have children. It has become popular with God-hating women and even some allegedly God-loving women to seek status and approval by fighting and working for that which cannot be taken beyond the grave. And yet for those who choose to be mothers, consider that if you bring your children upright and they choose to walk the path God has for them, you will experience the joy of having your children stand beside you in heaven. Your children will be the only thing that you will see beyond the grave. Consider Eve, the mother of all living one day she will be standing there in heaven and she will know that her actions in having children were responsible for all that great sea of humanity that she will see standing before her. Jesus died for your children. He did not die for your money. He did not die for your material goods. He did not die for your status or anything else. If you choose to have children as the Apostle Paul admonished you to do, then there is a possibility of seeing them in heaven. So in essence, what I have to say today is, was the authority of man over woman occurring in Genesis 3 or Genesis 2? And I maintain in summary that the order of authority was established at the time of creation and I pray that we as Christians will be able to submit ourselves to the authority of God as outlined 
in the Bible in the way that we read it today. And this is my sermon for you today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, George.